All right. I don't know. I did not you guys ready for this? No. Ready or not, here it comes. Hope you had some good snow days. Probably have a snow day tomorrow, but we'll see. Hope so. Yeah. My phone says five inches of snow, so it sounds like a snow day to me. But and I think it's you never to, know. I think it's supposed to like rain and ice too. Ooh, nice. Oh, really? Oh, if it rains, we're definitely be getting a snow day because of the ice. Yeah. Could be crazy. All right. Well, we better learn some chemistry because we might not tomorrow. All right. So this is the last part of these slides. I'm currently writing new slides that are being added because dual credit. Uh, but these are the last of this slideshow. We need to talk about something called intermolecular forces. There are many types of intermolecular forces. We're going to talk about three today. Um, there's also a bunch of different names for the same one, so we're just going to use the names I picked. Let's go with that. All right, so intermolecular forces are interactions between molecules that they're attractions, but they're not as strong as a bond. So it's this kind of in-between space where a bond is, it's so you can't even say temporary and permanent because bonds are not necessarily permanent because when you do a chemical reaction, you're breaking chemical bonds. So some people might say semi-permanent or a lot of definitions will say that a chemical bond is a lasting attraction. Like it just, it doesn't, <coughs> it, it doesn't break unless you force it to, I don't know. But there's these weaker attractions um, that are called intermolecular forces. And they still have a range of how strong they are, but all of them are weaker than a bond. Okay, so it's kind of a, a lower category. So in order from weakest to strongest, we'll talk about them in this order. We're gonna talk about London dispersion forces, which are named after a person, not a place. I think it's Fritz London. Uh, we have these things called dipole-dipole interactions, and then we have hydrogen bonding. Fun fact, hydrogen bonds are not bonds. They're just called bonds. Don't know exactly why, but they are. Okay, so these are the three we're gonna talk about, okay? They're attractions between different chemical species, but they're not a bond, okay? They're weaker than a bond and they don't, you can break them without doing a chemical reaction, okay? So, let's jump right in. Go, Go back, everyone panicked. Floyd, no, please. question is, what's a stronger bond, a covalent or ionic bond? Didn't you say ionic bond would be stronger? That's my guess, yes. You said that like it's also funny because you can just throw an ion in compounded water and it comes apart, so there's certain situations where it just readily comes apart, so it's almost like a key. It's like a stronger door, but if you just tap the key, it's like, oops, got through it. <laughs> I don't know. When my professor asked me that, that all went through my head at once and I didn't know what to say. So. And then he didn't tell me the answer, so there we go. Moving on. Sounds like you need email. <laughs> yeah, I should. Okay, uh, London dispersion forces, okay? So these are the weakest, the weakest attraction between molecules, um, but they are strong enough that we care about them, okay? Let me explain how they work. Question? Uh, yes. So you like mentioned how like you can uh, break these non-bonds, but like the, or, like they use attractive forces and it's not a chemical reaction? Yes. Is it, does it, but I know like, for example, like certain polymers are literally a, like a single molecule that's the full length if it's a, an intact polymer. So yes. Maybe it's a chemical reaction when you cut it because you're changing the chemical bonds. That is a good question. The typical definition would mean that it's, it's not a chemical reaction, but if you physically cut it, you would be breaking chemical bonds. So you'd be breaking chemical bonds without a chemical reaction. Okay. Which there are other ways to do that, but yeah, that is a that's an interesting question. The the best answer off the top of my head is you're breaking chemical bonds, but it's not a chemical reaction. All right. So, yes, what I said earlier of like breaking chemical bonds is always a chemical reaction is not always true. There's exceptions to everything. So, gotcha. yeah, I guess yeah, interesting. Okay, so what's the chemical formula for ethane? That's ethane. Close, but no, it's C2H2O. 
H6. Okay, C2H6. That's ethane. Oh, that's, that's a, okay. There's no, okay, so these are ethane molecules. Okay, great. Um, polar or nonpolar? That would be nonpolar, because it doesn't matter if the bonds are polar since they cancel out the same. Nonpolar. This is one bond you should memorize. Okay, not you don't need to know the numbers, but I would just memorize. CH is always nonpolar. That's like the classic nonpolar bond. If you want to know the numbers, carbon is 2.55. H is 2.2, so the difference is 0.35. Okay, uh, this is a very common bond. It's all over the world. It's in your body. Okay, carbon bonded to oxygen is very common, nonpolar. So if I and then obviously carbon bonded to carbon is as nonpolar as you can get. Okay, so nonpolar, nonpolar. So based on what we've learned, there's no reason to think that these um, molecules should be attracted or repelled. Based on what we've talked about, there's there's no there's really no electronic interaction between these molecules. But there actually is. Okay, so up to this point, we've talked about electrons as being in the bonds, right? We kind of draw these lines, and it represents two electrons. Okay, again, this is a simplified way of thinking about electrons and thinking about bonds. The reality is, is that all of these atoms have their own electron cloud, and when they bond together, we have orbitals that span the whole molecule. It's not completely unreasonable to think of the electron cloud as being around the whole molecule, and the electrons can be thought of as being present in all parts of the molecule. Okay? And because this is nonpolar, we could think of our electron density as being pretty evenly distributed everywhere. Okay? But turns out that the electron density or where the electrons are is not completely constant. Okay? So if we're thinking of electrons as particles, we can think of the electrons are moving around the molecule. And they're moving around randomly. So even though this is nonpolar, there might be a split second in time where I have slightly more electrons on one side, which means I have a slight negative charge over here just in a split second, which would then mean I have a slightly positive charge on this side. And for a very, very split second, I have a very weakly, you could say, polar molecule for like a nanosecond. I don't know what the time scale is, but like not very long because of random electron movement, okay? Well, okay, if I have a slight positive charge over here, what do positive charges do to electrons? They attract, yes? Mm -hmm. So even though I only have a positive charge, a slight positive charge for just a sliver of a second, I still can attract electrons, I'll just draw a little minus signs just to represent, to this side of this molecule again for a split second and if I have electrons over here that means this is slightly negative and I have slightly positive over here do we see how we might have an attraction yeah less than 0.5 like 0. 0.000, 000 yeah, yeah yeah so for a very small amount of time we have a very weak transient okay transients meaning it's just passing and then it goes away we have an attraction for a split second Okay, that attraction is called a London dispersion force. And then it goes away, and then it comes back, and it goes away, and it comes back, and it goes away. How often is that cycle repeated? I can't give you an exact number of how quickly it's happening, but it's like faster than any human can appreciate. Um, then how do we notice it? I, I'll show you on the next slide. Okay. There's actually animals that use this in their everyday life. But what this also tells you is um, what's our one thing I need to tell you is that so London dispersion forces are present for all molecules all molecules will have these random very weak attraction to other molecules whether they're polar or not it still happens so does that mean everything sticks to everything uh, um, it's probably well since it's a very weak sticking force if there was a stronger repelling force that they wouldn't stick fair enough but all molecules have London dispersion forces between them. So everything does have a sticky force at some level. Okay. It's just so weak and our muscles are strong enough that I don't know, I don't feel like my hand is sticking to the table, but it technically is in a very, very weak 
way. Okay, so these arise from induced. So induced means we're causing, we're attracting electrons to one side without physical contact. So induced, okay, so we have positive here and it attracted electrons to one side. Okay, a transient attraction. Could you force like a permanent charge to significantly strengthen the London dispersion forces? And if you had a permanent electric field, it would only affect polar molecules. If you put non-polar molecules in an electric field, um, they don't respond to the electric field, as far as I know. Well, I know, but is there like a way you could like pass a continuous current through it to force a continuous? Maybe if you can hold the molecule still. The complicating factor is the molecules are all vibrating around and going crazy. If you could hold them still in like one orientation, maybe. Um, I've never heard of that being done, but I, mean, I also happen. haven't researched it either, so I don't know. It would probably happen in like most superconductors because they're cold enough to be mostly still. And That's fair. They have a very large current. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Maybe it could happen. So this is London dispersion forces. Yeah, send me stuff if you find anything about it. That'd be interesting. Turns out, ooh, uh, oh, 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 oh. Yeah, I forgot this. Larger molecules will have stronger London dispersion forces. Why is that true? Could be more mass. What were you going to say? More electrons. I like it. We're heading in the right direction. So if instead of instead of ethane, what if I had like pentane? Why do I have a larger attraction? Okay, if I have a bigger molecule, is it because the charges are able to be more stable? I mean, they're still pretty unstable and temporary, but they're more stable? Mm hmm If I have, so if I, yes, so the, the idea here is we have more electrons to work with, for one thing, right, because I've got all these bonds, I'm, I'm not drawing my hydrogens, but they're there. And we also can get the electrons more separated, right? If I had electrons moving to one side over here, I might have a stronger slight negative and a stronger slight positive, which would induce a stronger negative here and I might have a stronger attraction, okay? It also could be the case where if I had these two molecules sideways, right, if they're running up and down, I could have a London dispersion force at the top and a London dispersion force at the bottom. There's just more opportunities for them to, to stick together. So I have more electrons and I have more room for the electrons to move because they're not leaving the molecule. Okay, But if they can move within the, the molecular orbitals of the cloud, which we'll talk about that later, molecular orbitals, um, we can get more charge separation and have a stronger force. It's not a bond, but a stronger London dispersion force. That is when electrons actually do hop over and you have actual positive and negative charges. Yeah. And your hair stands up because all your hair is negative and it's repelling itself. That's different. But kind of related, it's electrons. Okay, we okay with that? Blend dispersion forces. I told you that there's animals that actually use this. Oh, I remember reading about them. Turns out geckos are sticky, not because they have some slimy, sticky material, it's just their skin, but they have these teeny, teeny, tiny little pads, like, well, like their fingers, but like even smaller, there's these like little triangle. They're called like cilia or something. Yeah, it's not cilia, but it's it's like spatulae or something like some, yeah. some fancy Latin word, where their skin is very rough and there's a ton of surface area and because of the London dispersion forces being, even though they're weak, there's lots of them because there's lots of surface area contact from their toes and they are lightweight enough that they can just stick and climb on whatever surface they want and they don't need a sticky goo to make them stick. It's just the London dispersion forces are strong enough to hold them um, and they can stick. So with enough of those split second reactions constantly occurring, that's how you get a constant? Yeah, yeah. Everything sticks to everything a little bit. 
we are too heavy to take advantage of that because we would just rip, you know, we're stronger than that attraction, but they're lightweight enough and they have special skin that has enough surface area um, that they can like maximize those lemon dispersion forces. Kind of cool. Yeah, and then apparently they can also control it. And so like the question is how, cause they can choose to stick or choose not to stick. And so, I don't know, the one thing I read about that is they can control like whether the little tiny hairs are like flat on the surface or whether they like turn sideways. So I don't know, something like that. So they can maybe adjust the surface area. That's what I was reading. But it's London dispersion forces, right? There's there's no sticky goo that, you know, they don't have any, it's just their skin. But they're lightweight enough and there's enough surface area that they stick. Kind of cool. So London dispersion forces are not a bond. They're the weakest attraction between molecules, but they're significant enough um, that different creatures can take advantage of them. Okay, and it will affect it'll affect other things related to chemistry that we're going to talk about. Okay, so we got that. Next one. Dipole interactions. What's a dipole? Di means. We, yes, we, we are a magnetic dipole. In chemistry, we're not talking about magnets, we're talking about electrons. So we have, so it would be an electric dipole. Polar molecule. A dipole is just another name for a polar molecule, okay? If I have two polar molecules nearby each other, such as hydrogen fluoride and hydrogen fluoride, they have they are permanent dipoles. They don't have charge separation momentarily. They have charge separation always, right? Because of the electronegativity difference, right? I think by, if we go strictly by the numbers, this is technically ionic, but sorry. Pretend it's polar. Okay, so this end of the molecule is slightly positive always, and this end of the molecule is slightly negative always. So if these two molecules find themselves nearby, they're attracted because I got positive and negative. It's pretty straightforward, right? Is that it? That's it. So this is just like water attraction? Or mm -hmm. Water does the same thing. Water molecules are attracted to water molecules. You can actually see this with your eyes right if you spill water over it it, it beads like up in little droplets right? yeah it has it has a strong surface tension and it it beads up whereas if you think about oil i don't know how many of you guys cook right or if you spill oil oil doesn't bead up into little drops because they are not dipoles the oil molecules are nonpolar they are not attracted as strongly to each other so the oil can lay flat and spread out and make a very thin film so when you're cooking, you just pour oil in the pan. It doesn't beat up. It spreads out over the whole pan and it can get really thin. You can get really thin layers of oil. Whereas water, it's like, it's all, it's attracted to itself. And so it beads up in these little drops that are like really tall. Is that, I've so, that and that's due to the polar interactions. It's extremely strong surface tension and beads up even better than water does. Is that- What does? Mercury? Yeah, maybe. I've, I've never seen it, but I've heard that mercury forms like drops even better than water yeah um that's a metal so off the top of my head it's probably a metallic bond but it's a liquid yeah so here's a really nerdy thing that i did not know was a thing if you have a surface you can actually measure like there's people that like will take a droplet and they'll measure the angle between like the edge of the droplet and the surface to like measure how like hydrophobic or hydrophilic the the two surfaces are like there's people that like measure the angles of droplets like I did not know that was someone's job but apparently it is and that's just like a measure of how like uh, polar like yes yeah. oh well welcome to science my friend <laughs> it's all it all can be tedious but anyway um, yes so and the reason I'm bringing this up is because it has to do with is the liquid attracted to itself or is it not okay so Polar, attracted, okay? Not bonded, but attracted. This also happens if I had an ion, okay? So let's say I had a copper ion in water, 
Water is polar, yes? Mm -hmm. Which end of the water molecule is more negative? Oxygen. The oxygens, okay. So if I have a positive atom floating around in my water, the water will actually orient itself to where the slightly negative end of the molecule is facing the opposite charge. So is that how like water sticks to surfaces? Uh, yes, that can be how it sticks to surfaces, but this is also the process that happens when things dissolve in water, when ionic compounds dissolve in water because you can't just have copper plus by itself. It's always bonded to something. So maybe I had chlorides over here. Okay, copper chloride. Okay, these would also be in the water, but this would attract the positive end of the water, which is the hydrogen. Yes, are slightly positive. And so if I drop that in there, the water molecules are attracted to those ions and they actually will disrupt the bonds. And yes, this will actually break those chemical bonds. Remember we talked about dissociating where the ions separate in, a, in the solvent. Well, the reason that, that works is because even though this isn't positive and negative completely, it's slightly positive and negative, it's enough that it will be attracted to either end and it actually just pulls them apart. Okay, so that's called a dipole interaction. I have a dipole interacting with something else. Okay, this is a dipole interacting with a dipole. Okay, a dipole is just a polar molecule. Okay. Why are these stronger than London dispersion forces? Because they're polar molecules. Why does that matter? Because they have a set polar Yeah, does it ever turn off? No. Right, it never turns off. So they're stronger than London dispersion forces because they're ongoing. So even the polarity polar doesn't turn off. Even in a polar molecule, there's no point in which the electrons will be on the side that's not supposed to be usually negative. Uh, Appreciate yes, you. maybe, maybe. Yeah. Yes, I still have electron movement, yeah. but it's not enough for us to notice okay, cool. that it's not being polar anymore. And so, I don't know, I don't know, maybe, maybe it does stop being polar for a split second. Will but. they ever actually bond to each other? No, so that's the thing, is it's, it's strong enough to where they will interact, but they don't completely fuse together. Because the other thing you're competing with is you have to keep in mind molecules don't just sit perfectly still. They're vibrating really violently, right? All particles are kind of moving. And then obviously if you heat something up, they vibrate even more. So there's other like literal mechanical forces that are pulling against this. And this attraction is enough to kind of make them vibrate near each other in a certain way, but they're not gonna like stick together and stay together. So it's again, shades of gray, lots of shades of gray. Cool. Last one. Dun, dun, dun. Hydrogen bonds. What are they not? Bonds. They're not bonds. They're called hydrogen bonds, but they're not bonds. Why do they call them that? I'd have to go read a history book. I'm not sure. I'm sure it's on Wikipedia or something, but I forgot. Okay, so hydrogen bonds are super duper specific. You have to have a very specific situation where we can have a hydrogen bond, which is actually just an attraction between molecules, but not a bond. This is the most efficient way I can word it. Okay, so let's break this down. Hydrogen bond is an attraction between a hydrogen atom bonded to a highly electronegative atom. Okay, so let's set that up. I've got hydrogen bonded to N or F. I'm just gonna put all three, okay? Cause it doesn't matter. So this is not a real molecule. I'm just making a diagram. And what does it need to be near? Another, so this hydrogen needs to be near another NO or F that has at least one pair of dots on it. Does that have to be near the hydrogen or does it not matter? Does it, does what have to be? Like, uh, orientation is pretty important, right? So, sure. Do the they have to be near each other. Does a lone pair have to necessarily be near the hydrogen? Or uh, it will be because they're going to attract. Okay. So, this is what's going on. 
Okay, so let's break this down. Why is this hydrogen attracted to those electrons? That's the question. So that attraction is the hydrogen bond, quote unquote. Okay, obviously these electrons are gonna be kind of negative charged, yes? Mm -hmm. Is hydrogen just positive because the other one's electronegative? Well, yeah, hydrogen is just neutral normally, like it's just an atom. But what happens to hydrogen when it's bonded to something that is highly electronegative? It's nonpolar. Mm, opposite of what you said. We're gonna have a very polar bond. Nitrogen has a very high electronegativity. So does oxygen and fluorine. These are the top three on the periodic table as far as I know. Okay, so this bond is gonna be polar. Oh, yeah, the bond I was talking about. Something else? Oh, okay. So I have slight negative charge here. I have slight positive charge here. Whether or not this whole molecule is polar doesn't really matter. It's just this bond that needs to be polar. So now check out what's going on. I've got a slight positive charge near a whole negative charge for electrons, and obviously they're going to be attracted. So that attraction of a slightly positive hydrogen near a uh, lone pair of electrons over there on a highly electronegative um, element gives us our hydrogen bond. The reason it wouldn't bond yeah. is because the attraction isn't strong enough to actually pull electrons off of this and make a covalent bond or a, or an ionic bond. So does that uh, floating electronegative atom have to have a cumulative like, negative charge? This? Yeah. It does not have a cumulative negative charge. Okay. It just has a lone pair. It has enough electrons. So maybe this minus charge is misleading. It's not like negative one, but it's negative enough that there's electron density there that it's attracted to. Okay, cool. Yeah. So what are some molecules that could do this? How about this? or nitrogen trihydride and dihydrogen monoxide, also known as ammonia and water. Do I have hydrogen bonded to a highly electronegative atom? Yeah. Yes. Is this hydrogen near a highly electronegative element with lone pair? Yeah. Hydrogen bond, they're attracted. They're not bonded, but they're strongly attracted. What if I just had two ammonias? Could two NH3s hydrogen bond with each other? If I orient them correctly, do I have hydrogen bonded to NO or F? Mm -hmm. Do I have this hydrogen also near an N or F with lone pair? Yeah. What about water? Can water hydrogen bond with itself? Yeah. That's what gives it its orientation, right? Or like that's how it stays. both so that's the cool thing is water is a dipole so it has the dipole interactions from before it also has the London dispersion forces from before and can it hydrogen bond H bonded to N or F H nearby an O with lone pair yeah so water is very attracted to other water molecules surface tension. It's why it takes a lot of, it takes a very high temperature to boil it, right? So if you think of boiling, boiling is literally just, I'm heating up the sample so much that the particles are vibrating so much that they fly away. 
That's what boiling is, right? It just flies out of the pot, goes up into the air. That's literally what's happening. Well, if they've got all these attractive forces between them, I, it takes a lot of energy in order for it to actually boil away. Whereas if I had some other molecule, what was this one called again? This is called ethane or dicarbon hexahydride. No one called it that. Everyone called it ethane. Can this hydrogen bond with other ethane molecules? No. No. Are these dipoles? Are they polar? No. No, they're not polar. So no hydrogen binding, no dipole. Can they lend in dispersion force with each other? Yeah. Yes. Sure. So they have very, very weak attractions. So if I wanted to boil some ethane, do you think it takes a high temperature or a relatively low temperature? Relatively low. Low, yeah. So I'm kind of getting ahead of myself in a couple of slides. The boiling point and melting point of materials is directly related to which intermolecular forces are present and how many of them are present. Water, you have to get all the way up to 212 Fahrenheit to boil it, whereas a ton of other molecules will boil at 100 Fahrenheit or 80 Fahrenheit pretty low temperatures. Some of them are already boiled at room temperature. Okay, methane is just CH4. At room temp, it's already a gas. It already boiled at some lower temperature. Okay, because the, the attraction between the molecules is very weak, and so they just fly apart very easily. Or they get picked up by the air, however you want to think about it. Okay, so that's hydrogen bonding. Okay, da -da -da, misnomer, okay. Hey, look, that's what I just said. Hydrogen bonds lead to higher boiling points, okay? And then it also accounts for some special properties of water, okay? So the biggest thing here is just, actually, this is gonna be on a later slide, so I'm just gonna move on, okay? So fun fact, this is where we get all of our different types of ice, okay? This is also why water expands when it freezes, because if I can slow, so when I have liquid water, all the particles are vibrating, but if I cool them down, they vibrate less, they're able to actually orient themselves and align and do the hydrogen bonding. And in order to align, they kind of spread out to make space for everyone. And then it's kind of cool. You can actually align them in a bunch of different ways. So this is where you get your different types of ice. Okay, so this is liquid water, right? They're all just jumbled around and all random. But then if I cool them down and make them move less, notice how they all line up. Are all of the ices Uh, good question. Let's find out. So these are, so this is called a phase diagram. This is temperature along the bottom and this is pressure on the top. And then each region, so each number is like a different type of ice. There's liquid and there's, is that gas? So on Earth, atmospheric pressure is 100,000 or 100,000 Pascal right here, sorry. And then these are the different temperatures. So here is liquid water freezing. It looks like we have IH. The atmosphere of pressure doesn't change, but we can change the temperature. So here I have IC, whatever that is. That temperature is negative 100 Celsius. Does that happen on Earth? Probably not. And then I, apparently if I get colder than that at negative 200, 300, what is that, 200 Celsius, you get this other type of ice. So those are in like space and stuff? Maybe space, um, yeah, or then if I want these other types of ice, I gotta get up to like a thousand atmospheres. So, pretty high pressure. So probably in a lab where I get really cold and then I pressurize it and the molecules like get in different arrangements. But pretty freaky, there's like 10 or 11, right? It's count the 11. Kinda cool. Side note, anyway. This is why things are sticky. What's honey made of? Well, this is why sticky things are sticky. Is that honey made of? Sugar? Yeah, sugar. What's sugar made of? Glucose. What's glucose made of? CHs and Os, yeah? Here's some sugar molecules. If I had lots of those nearby each other, I can't remember if that's, I think that's glucose, not fructose. I think that's glucose. Um, if I had a bunch of glucoses nearby, do you see any opportunities for hydrogen bonding? No. 
Yeah, if I had another OH, right, and if that was bonded to something, this H is bonded to N O or F, yes? Mm -hmm. And then it could be nearby another N O or F, and by N O or F, I mean O, hydrogen bond. But then how many times can it do that on one molecule? Like six, so that you can make like six hydrogen bonds maybe. Okay, maybe not six, there's probably, depending on how it's oriented. Okay, so there's all our sugar. That's glucose, fructose, and sucrose. Okay, but because of all these oxygen atoms that are bonded to hydrogen, we have all this opportunity for hydrogen bonding and it literally sticks to things. Like you can actually feel that attraction. Hydrogen bonding is significant enough that you can physically feel it. You touch honey and it sticks to you because you are made of um, oxygen and hydrogens that are near the surface of your skin that hydrogen, you are hydrogen bonding to the honey. Obviously you just wipe it off and you break the bond, but that attraction is there and you can physically feel it. So how do they make non-stick stuff? That's a whole other, somehow you minimize any attractions that would happen. You, you pick the right elements and the right type of bonding and somehow you figure out to where it's like, we are not doing that. So, I don't know, I'd have to look up how Teflon works or whatever. That's the non-stick stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I'd have to look up Teflon. But yeah, definitely probably don't use oxygen, don't use nitrogen, right? Don't use probably electro, although I think it might use fluorine. Well, that just ruined my theory. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to look at how non-stick works. That's kind of interesting. Okay, so let's let's review here, okay? So, we've got a whole spectrum of attractions, okay? The strongest attraction between two atoms. What if I wanted to go stri stronger than hydrogen bonding? Would be a whole bond, right? The strongest attraction would be a whole bond, okay? And we're gonna say that ionic is the strongest bond. But there's other attractions that are weaker. Okay, so now our spectrum just got even bigger. Okay, we can go off the scale of covalent and go into intermolecular, okay? And then within that, I then have subcategories there in that order of strength, okay, where London dispersion forces are the weakest attraction, but they still matter. Okay, so these have effects on whether things are sticky. They have effects on the boiling point and melting point. They also have effects on whether something is really runny or whether it's oozy, like, so the viscosity. That would all be hydrogen bonding, wouldn't it? Most likely, most likely. Or if you just have really giant molecules that have like really strong, I don't know, LDFs, I don't know, maybe, yes? Tape, so tape somehow is taking advantage of one of these is my best guess. There's different types of tape that probably have different chemicals that stick at different strengths. So I can't speak for all tapes. So it'd be like but duct tape is more like hydrogen bonded than like Maybe, tape. yeah, maybe. I'd have to like call the company and ask them to tell me their secret chemicals that they use for their tape. They probably would. But I'm sure they're, the, the chemists at the duct tape company have figured out like, how do we make a material that takes advantage of this stuff and then you know it comes off but it goes on like all that great stuff like yeah there are chemists that had to figure out that problem and then we have tape so it's cool stuff okay so last thing physical properties okay so this is just kind of a review of all this so we've said all of this if you want to write it down you can okay boiling point and viscosity are affected by these LDFs, okay? So like molasses? Would it's gonna have lots of attractions, yeah. Which is, it's kind of sugar, right? But With other stuff. so does hydrogen, or so does water. And water flows more than molasses. Right, so I should probably add a point here that it, I would guess it has to do with larger molecules. Right, if you have big molecules, they can't move past each other. Whereas if you have little ones, they can move around and the water will flow more easily. So a question I'll ask you on a worksheet might, might be, here's a compound, here's a compound, which one has a higher boiling point? You can accurately predict whether something boils at a higher or low temperature if you just compare the intermolecular forces. Which one hydrogen bonds, which one doesn't? And 
those predictions usually are true. So it's kind of cool. All right, I'll let you write that down if you want, and we'll call it a day. We'll do a worksheet later. Although I should probably just give it to you now so you can do it over the snow days, which is what I'm actually going to do.